How's it going, my friends? Well, this is going to be uh, another video about ghost plant. And uh, ghost plant or ghost flower uh, is... It's a very interesting herb. I'll just put it that way. The name is Monotropa uniflora. Uniflora meaning one flower, obviously. Um, I made previous videos about this, and I don't need to go into detail about what they are, because I'm sure there are a dozen videos right next to mine that... Uh, show where where it grows and how it grows. I'm just going to get into my personal experiences as far as uh, what I've heard reported from this plant, the studies that I've done, and what it means to go into the woods and to ask to be shown where the medicine is. And then to five minutes later sit down next to a tree and look over next to you and see a bunch of monotropa uniflora growing. It was the first time that I'd been introduced to this ghost plant. It was about two years ago. And I just assumed, well, nature showed me some medicine, and then I looked closer, and now these are some dry ones, to give you an example, but when they grow, they're white, and there's a flower here on the top, and I looked over and I saw a bee pollinating a white flower. Now that blew my mind, because flowers are not white. I should say flowers are white, but the flower stems and leaves are not usually white. A uh, completely white plant means that there's no chlorophyll. And that means that it's either a symbiosis or it's a parasite. So I came home and I researched it more and come to find out that it is it, it lives in between the tree and the fungal world. It's not necessarily a parasite from what I understand, but I guess you could call it a parasite merely because it doesn't give back. But it seems to be what they might call it the... Um, there are some particular you know, uh, native names for it, which is like, I think it was like the guardian of the woods or the watcher or something like that, but the uh, natives would use it, they'd use the juice for it to, for eye infections and problems like that. It's also been used internally as an anti-spasmodic, um, anti-convulsant. People have even suggestively used it to come down from psychedelic trips. Apparently, people who have taken it for pain, and it was also called, uh, it's also called corpse plant, but which is ironically more interesting because people would use it to help them get over mourning of a lost loved one. And I've also heard people using it for physical pain. Now the interesting thing is that it seems to not remove the pain. It sets you beside your pain. And somebody compared it to nitrous oxide in the way that it doesn't remove the pain. You still know it's there, but it doesn't bother you. And I believe, from what I've heard, this is what it, it helps people to process the pain, the grief, without covering it up. You can take drugs and substances to cover up an emotion, but this one allows you to deal with the grief, just like people can learn to deal with the pain. I found that really interesting. I've been up the last two times in the last couple of years, and I've only found them at that one spot and one other spot. So I have one special spot where I go to harvest these things under one tree, and they're there every year, but only usually after a brief rainy spell. So it'll be in the middle of summer, you know, around August. And uh, so I can only harvest so many. And here was another reason I wanted to make this video, is because I've watched several videos of people who say to use the root parts, okay? Now, as a lover of herbs, a lover of entheogens, a lover of nature, I understand that different parts of the plant produce different effects. But I don't believe that there's enough study done on these to confirm that the root is the best part to use. But even if it is, I would suggest if you're going to harvest ghost plant, please chop it off at the base of the stem, only take what you need, and never take more than half of a bundle. Because these grow on the mycelium, which is in the ground. The mycelium is the brain, the neural network of the entire forest. It is growing on that mycelium, and it's using the sugars from these, which are being exchanged because the fungus, they help to transport water and nutrients between plants. It's an entire system. By removing this and pulling it out by the roots, it's as if you're ripping the switch out of your wall, you know, that connects your, or, or ripping one of your outlets out of the wall and, and breaking the connection to all the rest of them. Of course, they can create new networks, and they will, you know. It's very resilient. Mycelium will do what it needs to do, but don't do any more damage than you have to do. From what I understand, the aerial parts are just as good. Now, I made a tincture a couple of years ago, and I remember I mentioned that while I was making it, I, my hands were purple by the end of cutting it all up. That night I slept for like 12 hours straight, and it was a deep sleep. 
and I realized in the morning, because my hands were dyed purple for two days afterwards, I realized there was some component within it that was very medicinal. So this year I went back and I harvested all these fresh, and this is uh, the only bundle that I harvested because I didn't want to take too many. And uh, these are still in the process of drying. Uh, they turn completely black from their original white state. And they have such a distinct smell that once you've smelled ghost plant, you will never, ever, ever forget that smell if you smell it again. You'll know exactly where you smelled it. It's one of those very distinct odors. And I'm not sure about the terpene profiles, and I won't get into the specific comp compounds within it because they're not very well known. So, it's a traditionally used plant for the sake of easing anxiety, easing depression, things like that, but generally for pain. And uh, <clears throat> But it works in a completely different way. Now, I sent some to one of my subscribers who asked, and he, some of the dried stuff from last year's harvest, which I ground into a powder, and that was another thing I wanted to make. He said he took, I think it was a quarter teaspoon or maybe a half teaspoon, and in maybe in a tea, I can't remember how he mentioned how he made it, but it, uh, he said it was very relaxing and uh, seemed to be a tranquilizer type effect, which is basically what I've been told that it does. Um, I'm cautious about when I experiment. I have to make sure that I'm of clear mind when I try something new, and, and I will be trying these again, but uh, I made a tincture as well last year, and it's still on my shelf. I would say the reason why I don't support tinctures as much as I support raw powders of herbs is because tinctures pull out some components, but I believe that that transference causes perhaps some of, something is left behind. I'm not sure, but even more than that, there's something about tinctures that doesn't quite fulfill the role of uh, the plant itself. This is an experience I've had with, with cannabis, with kratom, with all different types of herbs, that the raw plant seems to always carry the best benefits. But that's my opinion, of course. A tincture can be anything, and that's what makes it difficult to assess. But uh, generally, ghost plant has a very distinct smell, so you can't really mistake that one. Another thing about tinctures is that they can't be shipped without certain regulations. You know, you're, you're not supposed to ship uh, you know, anything that's alcohol without certain other labeling. That's why I think a lot of people don't want to deal with it. But... Um, when it comes to the plant itself, what I'm going to be doing is grinding it up, and I'll probably put it on my website down the line, just small amounts for people who really want to try it. But my long-term goal is to go up and to have these things continually harvested, not just these plants, but various types of fungi and mushrooms. Um, I'm fascinated with many of the, the, the old-growth forests up here where I live. I live in the Pacific Northwest, um, between Oregon and Washington here, so I'm right in the middle of primo territory. Um, this is like Paul Stamets country. He's like the mus mushroom master. And if you look at some of Stamets work and you look at the mushrooms that they're finding, um, many of these big, what they call polyphores, which they grow on the sides of trees and you'll see these huge like fungal shelf mushrooms. Some of them can get up to hundreds of years old. Huge, huge things. And they're finding that the reason why they can live so long is because of their defensive mechanisms within the structure of the fungi. And humans have been taking it to help with all types of problems.